Welcome back to Season 2 of 12 Days in March. In this section, we will resume our discussion of shock by focusing on the specific clinical scenarios you should be familiar with for Step 1, as well as the associated pharmacotherapeutic agents. This slide should serve as a reminder of material covered in the previous module and which conditions will be addressed in this video. So what do you need to know about cardiogenic shock? The specific scenarios will include acute MI, and that MI will generally be an anterior wall transmural MI in the LAD territory. This will be the most common scenario because other clinical scenarios don't lend themselves to test questions on pharmacotherapy. So the other scenarios associated with cardiogenic shock are LV rupture. Remember that occurs on days 5 to 10 post MI during the macrophage tissue response. A patient with LV rupture is not apt to survive, and the test questions will focus on cardiac pathology of acute MI covered in a separate video presentation. A patient with papillary muscle rupture and acute mitral regurgitation will generally present with acute heart failure and a new murmur. Again, the focus of these questions are on cardiac pathology. Cardiac tamponade, by definition, is a shock-like scenario. This topic is covered in our pericardial disease section, but again, questions will focus on making the diagnosis or the clinical etiologies. So circling back to the most common scenario, acute MI, the derivative issue will focus on therapy. The mainstay of management is dobutamine, a beta-1 agonist. Please note, it is an inotropic agent, not a presser. The goal of therapy with dobutamine is to increase cardiac output in that failing heart. As a beta-1 agonist acting through cyclic AMP, it increases contractility and as such may increase myocardial oxygen demand. It also has mild beta-2 effects and may cause a decrease in total peripheral resistance just to underscore its role as an inotrope and not a presser. So let's move on to vasodilatory shock and specifically septic shock. The non-pressor related derivatives pretty much deal with bacterial cell wall products such as lipopolysaccharides and or bacterial products such as staph exotoxin associated with toxic shock syndrome. Insofar as treatment, this will be the classic scenario associated with the use of norepinephrine. As you can see, it is a very nice agent in the septic patient with alpha-1 properties to raise mean arterial pressure and beta-1 properties to stimulate cardiac contractility and increase heart rate. Unlike epinephrine, it has no significant beta-2 properties and thereby no potential for vasodilation of vascular smooth muscle supplying skeletal muscle. Insofar as anaphylactic shock is concerned, epinephrine is the agent of choice specifically due to the beta-2 bronchodilating properties. Thus, the subtle differences between norepinephrine and epinephrine owing to the beta-2 effects determine the different clinical scenarios and indication for use. Before leaving anaphylaxis, please be aware of some key descriptors. I think we all recognize it as a type 1 hypersensitivity reaction, meaning it is IgE-mediated, leading to mast cell degranulation. When mast cells degranulate, they release histamine and leukotrienes, of which we are all familiar. They also release proteases, and one of those proteases is tryptase. Its specific role as a protease is not important to this discussion, but do be aware of its role as a marker of mast cell degranulation. It is a sneaky little piece of information that they might drop to describe a mast cell mediated process such as anaphylaxis. Moving to hypovolemia, these questions are almost always about derivatives and there are no specific pharmacologic agents. The mainstay of management is restoring volume. So what are those derivatives? Most assuredly, hypovolemic shock is almost always going to have some renal component. These are ideal questions to test your understanding of prerenal azotemia compared with acute tubular injury. These distinctions will be made through urinalysis showing muddy brown granular casts in the setting of ATN or low FINA values with a high BUN to creatinine ratio in the setting of prerenal azotemia. This is also a low yield scenario where a patient might receive multiple transfusions of packed red blood cells that result in dilutional thrombocytopenia. And finally, they can certainly query you about physiologic responses to low blood pressure. However, treatment of the hypovolemic patient entails volume with IV saline and or blood products. And here's a brief review of the agents. Phenylephrine is a pure alpha agonist. 
As such, it raises blood pressure and total peripheral resistance. It has a variable effect on cardiac output, which makes sense. Increasing afterload would be expected to decrease cardiac output. The most common indicated clinical use for phenylephrine is in the patient with post-anesthesia hypotension. In terms of pure beta agonists, be familiar with dobutamine as previously discussed in the section with cardiogenic shock. Again, note the minor beta-2 effect, which can decrease total peripheral resistance and thereby blood pressure. You should also be familiar with isoproterenol and why it is not used during shock. That is, note the beta-2 effect that causes vasodilation of vascular smooth muscle. As such, blood pressure decreases with isoproterenol, but heart rate increases. And this is the common compare and contrast scenario the USMLE likes to do between norepinephrine and isoproterenol. They'll show experimental graphs with two agents increasing heart rate, but one of them raises blood pressure while the other lowers blood pressure. You'll have to guess which agent is represented by the curve. As far as clinical use, isoproterenol is now limited to use in the bradycardic patient who is hemodynamically stable or in the patient with torsade de point owing to its property of shortening QT interval. And finally, our mixed alpha and beta agents. As previously reviewed, epinephrine is ideally suited for anaphylaxis owing to the beta-2 properties, whereas norepinephrine is reserved for septic shock. While we're in the neighborhood, I would remind you that norepinephrine is converted to epinephrine by the enzyme phenylethanolamine N-methyltransferase. And it's probably sufficient just to remember N-methyltransferase. This reaction takes place primarily in the adrenal medulla. And to emphasize this point, I would also remind you that epinephrine is the primary hormonal product of the adrenal medulla. They do seem to like the N-methyltransferase enzyme. And that will conclude our two-part video module on the shock states that you are most likely to encounter on USMLE Step 1 and how they will be presented. Please be familiar with the key adrenergic receptors and their role in these shock states. If you have any questions or concern, feel free to email me at 12 days in March. Thank you.